You guys see my presentation? Yeah, we can see it. Please go ahead. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Ditish Gupta and welcome to this introductory lecture on enforcement learning. Um, this presentation is split into two parts. In the first part, I'll discuss the motivation and introduce the key ideas behind RL. Um, this will be followed by RL problem formulation and understanding Bellman's um, expectation and optimality equations. Um, in the second part of this uh, lecture, we'll explore two categories of RL method, tabular and approximate solution-based, and iteratively go through different methods of solving an RL problem. Um, so this is basically a recap. I might uh, go a little faster, um, but please interrupt me anytime uh, if you feel um, something is not clear. Um, so. First of all, what is RL? Think of um, how we humans or other creatures on our planet learn to interact with our surrounding. Um, the way we learn a new skill, such as walking or excelling at a subject, um, this natural way of learning is through the cause and effect of our action, which are more than often rewarded by something. Um, please note that the meaning of reward here contains both positive and negative feedback. Um, in short, we always try to take action to affect our environment such that our reward can be maximized, right? Um, that's exactly the motivation behind enforcement learning. Um, given that context, um, we are the actors um, and the agents basically of our life. Um, uh, and our life is basically our environment and our action decide how well uh, rewarded our life would be. Um, so the, the, the domain of enforcement learning has been well studied in many different areas with different perspectives, such as computer science, engineering, maths, neurology, and so on. However, our focus here will be to formalize the problem mathematically first, and then also study some algorithm from computer engineering um, and science and also machine learning perspective. So um, looking into machine learning, um, uh, machine learning domain, it is often considered that supervised and unsupervised learning algorithm can exhaustively classify all machine learning problems. However, when it comes to reinforcement learning, this assumption falls apart. Unlike supervised learning in RL, we don't have access to data samples and their targets. Um, similarly, unsupervised learning algorithm try to find a structure in the data. Um, in contrast, in RL, the agent tries to learn from its experiences and the only goal is to maximize the, the return, the, the scale or return, as opposed to finding a structure in the data in unsupervised learning. Also, the, the RL problem, unlike the other two, is non-IID. Uh, it's not identically uh, distributed. It's not in, the samples are not um, independent of each other. Therefore, time really matters here as experiences might be correlated to each other over time. Um, here are a few examples that can be formulated as RL problem, um, like investment portfolio, playing games against humans, human players, and then making a humanoid walk or maybe driving a car um, using reinforcement learning. Um, 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 a typical RL problem consists of an agent and an environment. At any time step T, the agent in state S takes an action A in the environment. The environment receives this action and transitions the agent to a new state S dash. Um, the agent also receives a reward R um, in the next time step, depending on how good or bad the state action transition was uh, that, they, that the agent took. Um, the, the environment transitions um, the agent based on, on its own model. If the environment model is fully uh, understood and known to the agent, uh, the, the states are called to be fully observable, or the, on the other hand, uh, if the agent is only able to observe the environment partially, the states are said to be partially observable. Now, uh, let's try to formalize um, a um, typical RL. Quest yes. Question. Um, yes. So, so here, um, the way um, reinforcement learning is formalized, it seems to depend on the reward. Yes, and that's the goal of... Uh, the whole reinforcement learning to maximize that cumulative reward. But but also, um, it seems that it's it, it depends on the reward at each step. So what happens if, let's say we have to take multiple steps, let's say we're playing chess, we take so many steps, and, and finally, we, we know that we lose or we win. So in this case, do we have to translate that winning or losing into a reward for each of the steps that is being taken? So the reward has to be associated uh, throughout the, the state transition of the agent. So it cannot be just like the reward will only be given to the agent at the end 
the episode. So each of these sequence that you just mentioned from the start of the game to the end of the game, which is called terminal state, uh, this whole sequence is called an episode and um, the, the reward has to be distributed among each states. That's how um, we build the, the task for RL. Okay. It, it cannot be just like the reward can be only given at the end of the episode, because that way it will be um, not clear on which state uh, led to that reward. So there will be a um, problem um, for reward distribution. Great. So now this with uh, now with this key idea, let's understand the the jargon and try to formalize the RL problem. Um, this section might get um, a bit involved, so I request your undivided attention. Um, in RL, a reward is a scalar feedback signal used as a measure of agent's performance. As I said, the goal of the agent here is to maximize the cumulative reward over time. So basically, the sum of all the rewards that it gains throughout the episode. Um, now note that the agent's action may have long-term consequence, consequences also, or the reward might be delayed in itself. Um, in such cases, long-term reward um, has a higher value than the immediate, immediate reward. And we need to account for that in our reward formulation. So um, here are some basic reward um, uh, mapping for, for the example that we, uh, uh, that we saw before. Um, for, for instance, driving a car, a positive reward could be following a desired trajectory, a negative could be for crashing. Um, similarly, for investment portfolio, positive reward would be uh, gaining money and negative could be losing money um, over time. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, now we have been saying that the agent's goal is to maximize the cumulative reward, right? But there is one slight problem with that idea. What happens when the environment is cyclic or continuous in nature? Um, basically saying the episode never ends. Um, this cumulative reward might become unbounded, right? If we keep adding um, the reward in each time step. That's why a very common strategy called discounting is often used um, with reward formulation. Discounting also makes it more um, logical to assign importance to rewards based on when they were received. For instance, we may want to value our immediate reward more than the consecutive feature rewards or vice versa. This is, this is how the reward formulation with discount looks like um, at the bottom, right? Um, now, um, um, so the discount factor gamma takes a value from zero to one here, right? And it's multiplied to each consecutive reward. So RT plus one is there immediate reward that we get uh, from transitioning from a current state S at time T. And then the, the next reward is discounted by gamma. The, the next reward will be discounted by gamma square and so on. Um, therefore, when gamma is uh, zero here, our agent becomes myopic or will only value uh, immediate rewards. Um, and when gamma is one, the agent is farsighted and also values future rewards. Um, so we want to achieve a balance between um, between like this uh, using this discounting for our reward. Um, any questions so far for account for in, in regards to reward formulation? Cool. So um, a state in uh, reinforcement learning is assumed to hold a Markov property. Um, what does that mean? Uh, the Markov property assumes that the future states of the agent are only dependent on the current state and not on any of the past states. Um, another way of putting this is that the agent's current state contains all the necessary information required for predicting the future rewards or uh, states. As you can see in this equation here, um, the state from S1 to ST uh, on the right side are replaced with just ST on the left side. Therefore, now the probability of transitioning from ST plus, uh, transitioning to ST plus one is only dependent on our current state ST and not on any of the past states. Any question regarding this? Okay, now moving on to the, a term called policy. Um, in, RL, in RL, we often use the term uh, sorry, policy. Sorry, I actually have a yes. question. Uh, sure. Can we clarify this P? Uh, the P is the probability distribution. So it's the probability of transitioning from state ST to state ST plus one. So it could be distributed from ST, you might be, um, 
having a probability associating associated to transition to ST plus one, like 0.5, and maybe to another next state uh, could be 0.2, and then so on. I was, I was curious, like what, what happens if we were doing, let's say, a, a fuzzy control that your, your state does not fully determine your transition? Will, will such transitions still be marker? So it actually depends uh, on how the state is formulated in itself. It could be that you are considering a state as a combination of a lot of past state. For instance, you are quantizing past states, like five states, and that is considered as your current state. Uh, so that is possible, but um, the Marco property strictly says that um, whatever state representation you choose, um, needs to be independent of the past um, when it comes to the future state prob probabilities. Thanks. So um, as I said, um, in RL, we often use the term policy to represent the mapping of states to actions. This can literally be seen as a map for the agent. Um, um, if the agent has this map or so-called policy, it knows the way to navigate around this environment, right? Um, uh, a deterministic policy gives us an action to, um, to take in a state S with probability one. So um, given any state S, uh, the probability of taking this action will be one. Um, that's, that's based on the policy pi. On the other hand, a stochastic policy gives us a distribution of uh, probabilities over all the possible actions. Um, um, as in, in this um, expression, you can see for state S, um, the probability of transitioning to any of the next state A um, is distributed by, by this expression. So, so from state S, you might have, let's say 10 different action and each of those 10 action may have a probability associated. Um, the agent can then sample action from this distribution of probabilities um, or action. Any question about the policy? This P again here is the uh, denotes probability, probability distribution basically. Um, and more than often we'll be using a stochastic policy to represent pi because that's how the real world applications are. Um, now the value function, uh, which is the next term is the key concept in any RL problem. Um, the value of any state S, so consider the agent is in a, in a state S. Um, the value of this state S is the expected return, right? When the agent is, is starting from this particular state S. It's a measure of how good or bad it is to be in this particular state that the agent currently is in. As evident, as evident from the value function formulation here, the value of state S is the expected return GT denoted GT here right, starting from this particular state S. So, so this, uh, this basically denotes um, the value under certain policy pi of the state S, right? And it's nothing but the expected reward um, or the expected return that you will get when you start from the state. So consider the agent is in a large um, environment and uh, it's in the middle of, um, it, it's, it's in some state, it's, it, could, it, should, it, uh, it may not be a start state, right? So when the agent start from that random state that I'm just uh, putting the agent in, what is the reward that it can achieve um, when it uh, starts um, moving towards the end of the episode? So what is the total cumulative reward? And we know from the um, expression for, for reward and the discounted reward, basically, we know that it is formulated like this. So starting from state S, you get a reward RT plus one, always the reward is one time step delayed because it is coming from the environment, right? So um, um, the value of state S is nothing but um, RT plus one, gamma RT plus two, gamma square RT plus three and so on. Any question about this? So the value of a state is represented by the total cumulative reward you can achieve starting from that state S. Now, um, let's, this is a simple maze example, and it can help us understand policy and value function in a much more intuitive way. Um, here we consider the reward for all the transition to be minus one per time step. Um, the action space consists of four directions. Um, 
and the state is the agent's location in the grid. Um, now, the policy as it's defined previously um, is a mapping of state to actions, right? Um, here the, in, the, in the second grid, um, the arrows represent a policy for each state. So for, for being in the state, the action should be going right. And uh, you can choose any action and there's, there should be a policy associated with that. Um, sorry, any state and there should be a policy associated with that state. Um, um, and um, uh, here we are showing a deterministic policy. Uh, for a stochastic policy, you need to have those arrow distribu arrows um, distributed and you can maybe ha have a like a, the length of the arrow representing the probability of taking that action. Um, similarly, in the third grid, um, the value of each state is the expected return starting from that state to the goal. So if I'm considering, for instance, this state, this, um, this state the, the number of cells, because my reward is minus one per time step, it's basically reduces to a planning problem. So starting from here, um, then count the number of cells that should be the value of, of this particular state. Uh, any question about this? Okay. How how do you know the to this this uh, rewards or or the numbers before before you know the actual like solution? Um, you mean these numbers or the reward itself? These these numbers. These uh, numbers represented in the grid. Those numbers are basically coming by solving the RL problem. So there are several methods that I'll discuss in this presentation for, with which we can achieve these and these value, uh, value numbers for each state. So that's, that's like the goal of RL to, to get the value function, either get a policy if, if you can directly get the policy, that's, that's perfect uh, because you now know your agent now knows a map of the environment. Basically, given any state, it can it can navigate around it based on um, by sampling basically a, a, a probability from the action distribution. And um, when it comes to value function, um, you can just, for instance, here you can just look at your next states. So the value of next state uh, is the lowest in this case here, right? So a natural way what for the agent would be to transition to this cell instead of the previous cell. So the calculating these numbers, these, this value function is basically the goal of RL. Um, this or either the policy. Um, does, that, does, does that answer my uh, answer your question? Sure, thank you. So um, now similar to the value function, there is one more uh, very similar term called action value function, right? Um, uh, it's also called Q value um, in RL and it's, it's widely used throughout RL um, uh, um, um, in conjunction with uh, the value function actually. So the action value of a state S and an action A is the expected return when starting from that state S and taking an action A. So this is basically um, like looking one step ahead. So you are, your agent is in state S and it has decided to consider this action A. So what is the value associated with the state and action pair is nothing but the Q value. So the Q value formulation is again, very similar to the value function um, formulation, except for now we have an action A in addition to state S. So the GT remains the same, but now this GT is coming from after considering also an action in addition to a state. Any question about this? This is very important um, as will uh, next uh, mathematical expression will depend on these, this expression. So you can again split GT like, like we did in the, in the case of value function. Um, the last term in our formulation is model. Um, in RL, a model is the agent's representation of the environment. Um, using the model, the agent can predict the behavior of the environment. Um, the model essentially consists of a state transition function, um, which is denoted by italic P here, and a uh, state reward function, uh, which is denoted by italic R. Um, the transition function P gives us the probability of transitioning from state S to S dash for, for that particular action A. 
Um, similarly, state reward function, on the other hand, gives us a expectation of receiving a reward R um, when you are in, in state S and you're considering action A. Uh, this might sound a bit uh, similar to the value function for the, 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 the reward expression might sound similar to the Q value, but remember this is just one reward this, um, and it, it's an expected value again. Uh, it's not the GD, it's not the reward for the entire episode. Um, any question about this? Um, in, a, in a finite problem domain, these function can be easily represented as matrices. Um, now, to make it more clear, let's try to understand these uh, two, two functions for model, representing model by an example. Now, consider the simple state action transition model here. Um, as in the next slide, we will see this. This is popularly known as Markov decision processes. Um, 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 there, are, there are in total six possible states in this, um, in this diagram and two possible action, which is lazy, being lazy or being productive. If we consider this sequence of states um, here on the, on the left-hand side, right? Hangover, sleep, more sleep, visit lecture, study, or pass the exam in this order. Um, the state transition matrix for lazy and productive action can be represented like this. Now let's, let's see what this actually means. So consider each of these rows in the probability um, matrix matrix uh, represent the state in this order, okay? So this is considered the rows represent current state and the columns represent your next state um, in the same sequence, okay? Hang this column represent next state is hangover, next state is sleep and so on. So now if I consider for instance hangover and I'm, I've already locked my action, which is lazy, right? I have no probability for going from hangover to hangover. So I have it as zero but I have a probability, which is one um, to, to transition to sleep. That's why I have it one. There's no other probability of going to any other state when, when in hangover by taking an action lazy. So similarly, let's uh, solve one more. So for visit lecture, current state. So if we are in visit lecture here, the lazy action takes us to either study with point eight probability or pass the exam with point two probability. So that's what we have it here. So this, this column represent next state is study, which is second last and the next state is pass the exam. Similarly, you can um, solve for the other action productive, right? Any question about this? Is this clear? Okay, so now um, I did not, give an example for the reward, uh, expected reward, but you can think of um, reward as in transitioning from this state, taking this action like 100 times, what is the expected reward, expected value of the reward that you can achieve? So every time you, you are in this state and you take this action, your environment might give you uh, a different reward at each time step. Yes, Ashkan. I have a question. What if we don't know the space? Like, uh, let's say there might be some nodes that we still haven't discovered that there is. What what should we do then? That's an excellent question. Um, so as I said, this these two probabilities, basically the state transition probabilities and the expected reward proba uh, ex expected reward function, both of these represent a model. And in enforcement learning, we have two kinds of algorithms. One is model free and one is model-based. So for model-based, we need to know uh, this representation, these, these probabilities. But more than often in the real world, we are not aware of this. So uh, as we'll see, there are several algorithms to solve RL without a uh, given model like that. So, but this is like a basic, so I need, to, need you to know that um, this could be a representation for your model. Very simple one, but yes. Got it, thank you. Yes. So. Uh, the algorithms where we do not have these probab access to these probabilities, those algorithms are called model free. Now, any other question before I move to the next slide? All right. So um, everything that we just, just discussed in the previous slides can be finally combined to form Markov decision processes. Um, MDP, um, as it stands for, um, is a 
mathematical um, framework for modeling decision making problems and rl is one of the decision making problems uh, yeah. so here we represent our mdp for instance with the tuple um, states action transition probabilities reward function and a factor gamma so we already uh, went through each of these terms in the previous slides we know what states are which they should basically hold the marco property um, we know that we have a policy associated for action distribution for each state we also know what transition probability is for given any action means and then the reward is nothing but um, after repeated experiments, how, how much is the expected reward for transitioning from state S to uh, and taking an action A. Gamma is basically the um, discount factor. Any question about this? These are all the expression that we just saw in the previous slides. So uh, if not, I will move to the next slide. Now comes the um, complicated part. Um, just be with me, I'll try to explain each of these lines. Um, now that we have defined our RL framework as MDP, let's uh, further formalize value and state value functions. Okay, um, we, are always, we, are, we have already seen that um, under a policy pi, our value function is defined like this, which is nothing but expectation, um, the expected reward GT when you're starting in state S, right? Um, now splitting this term GT, let me try to write here in my head. So, if I uh, have to split this term, okay, yes. So if I have to split this term GT, I know that GT basically represents my cumulative reward like this, right? And gamma square R T plus three and so on. However, if I simplify this by taking gamma out, I am left with this, right? And note that this is nothing but a recursive formulation for reward. So this becomes GT plus one. This is gamma. So if I'm handwriting. So now my GT is represented as two terms, which is nothing but immediate reward RT plus one, expected immediate reward RT plus one, and discounted uh, return for the next state. And note that this return is not just the return for the next state, it's the complete return for this episode. Okay, so that's why from GT we get this. Any question about this? Now, if we are given the model, basically saying we are given the um, trans state transition probabilities that we saw earlier, and the reward function, right? We can replace this expectation with that straight transition probability first, right? However, there's an action associated with each of these probabilities. So I have to consider the probabilities associated um, with each of these actions. So um, this is well, uh, this can be well explained with the diagram, which I have in the next slide. So um, let's pin it here. Um, and um, so further solving this, this is the simplified version. This is the final expression when the model is given, right? This is an expression for the value function um, given a policy pi. Any questions so far? I know um, that this part might not be very clear, but I'll, I'll explain that in the next slide with the diagram. Um, similarly, um, Actually, let's just move on to the next slide and then look at this expression. So, so um, these are the graphs uh, which are called backup diagrams in reinforcement learning, very popular. Um, so for value function, this is our graph, okay, our backup diagram. Um, we always start in state S, that's all that we are given, right? So we are, estimate, we are trying to estimate the value of the state S given a policy phi, right? Uh, basically given a map, um, of all the action distribution. Um, now we are trying to estimate this value, but um, starting from this state, we can take any of these action and for taking, for the probability associated for taking each of this action is given by our policy pi, right? So I have a probability associated with each of these lines. 
right? And when you have considered this action and have, um, when, you have when you consider one of these actions, for instance, this one, you again have a state transition probability distribution over all the next state, even, have, even being in this action, uh, taking this action. So the probabilities here on these lines are basically coming from our state transition probabilities, right? So I have to reach from here to this next state S dash. I have to multiply this probability with each of this and similarly like that. So that's what the previous expression that we saw for value function tells us. So you have to multiply starting from state S, you have to multiply, you have, when you are considering one of the action, you have to take the probability of taking that action into account, multiply it by the state transition probability of selecting that action uh, after being in state S and transitioning to any of the next state S dash. And this reward is basically the reward associated when you do that transition. So any question for the value function? Okay, awesome. Similarly, um, if I uh, look at the backup diagram for the Q value function, okay? So the Q value is basically the state action value. So you have a state S, your agent was in state S, but it has already considered an action, considered an action A, right? So you're basically at this point, if you look from this perspective. So um, considering this state and action pair, I now only have a probability associated to my state transition matrix, which I explained earlier. So I have probability associated with this line, with this line, which is coming from basically the state transition probabilities. And I don't have to worry about the action probabilities anymore. And that's why in the Q value formulation, you'll see there's no um, policy pi present here. It's only this expression because you have already considered an, considered an action. Any question about Bellman expectation equations? Oh, um, I missed one thing. So when I considered discounted return for the next state, we replaced it with this, which is interesting because the gamma is outside, that's fine. And since we are in the state S and we are still under this expectation, I can basically replace this GT plus one, given the state S dash, right? With the value function of the next state. Does that make sense? So I first come from here to here, and then I get this value, uh, sorry, this value, which is the value under policy pi for next state S dash. Similarly, we have it for here also. The internal things do not change, it's still the return for both value and the state, uh, the Q value function. The only thing that is different is this distribution, the probability distribution. Now there's one more backup diagram on the right side of this slide. So um, this is basically showing a relationship between your V pi and Q pi. So starting from state S, your V pi is located here while your Q pi is located here. So you have already considered this action, right? And these connection have a probability which is coming from your policy, right? And in case of when you're starting with state and action, right? Um, your next state will hold the value functions. So this is value for next state S dash and this is the Q value for this particular node. And when you transition, these will have, uh, um, sorry for, so these, these lines will have a state transition probability and the reward function associated. Um, now, moving on to the Bellman's optimality equations, which are very similar to what we saw um, in the expectation equation, just uh, these equations are for optimal, uh, optimal conditions. Now, as can be seen from the backup diagram on the, on the right side, the optimal value function can be represented. Um, so optimal value function here can be represented by the maximum Q value across all the possible action. Does that make sense? So the value of the state, I can say the best value would be the 
the best Q value across all these axes. So that's why I have this expression here. So I'm considering maximum Q value among all the actions that I have available. So that's the first relationship formally um, um, between value and Q value. And then we go ahead and substitute the uh, expectation equation for Q pi. And we have this. And for the solving it, we know that Q can be represented with just the straight transition and the, and the return. And now for this optimal value function, we do not have to consider the policy distribution, uh, the action distribution, which is coming from policy because we have max of, uh, max of over all the action. So we are not considering all the action. Basically we are considering only the value corresponding to the best value. We are only considering the action corresponding to the best value. Similarly for the Q value, optimal Q value, um, we can basically represent this in terms of uh, the Q value in the next state. So um, here, we, when we simplify this expression, what we got um, from this expression is the relationship between your value of current state and the relationship between optimal value in the next state, right? Similarly, you can represent the Q value of your um, current state and action in terms of Q value, optimal Q value of um, um, next state uh, state and actions. So note that these are S dash and A dash, both are basically, so this, 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 or this. So um, this probability is basically for this line, right? And I'm taking max over all these four pairs. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, I yeah. have a question. Yes. Uh, it's possible in some cases the maximization and equation change to the minimization equations. So in some projects or in some cases. In RL, it is strictly we are so all of these expressions are built upon the expected return, right? So we in RL the main goal of the agent is to maximize the return. So we'll never see a case where we want to minimize these expressions. So remember value function is nothing but um, the return when you're starting in state S. So why would you ever want to minimize it? You want to, you want to know uh, for each state, you want to know the true value that you can, or I would say true return that you can get starting from that state. All right, it makes sense, yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess um, these expression will make more sense as we um, proceed to other slides. Um, all RL approach takes um, one of these forms based on whether we are trying to learn value function or the policy function or both. Similarly, based on whether the environment model is known or not, we can have model based on model free approaches as I mentioned earlier. So in model based, we need to know the model. Um, so um, just a note on, on a very popular dilemma in reinforcement learning. Um, in reinforcement learning, as the agent is learning constantly based on some policy, right? The actions uh, the agent takes are important. In some cases, we are too dependent on our current policy um, if you are too dependent on our current policy, the agent might try to exploit the knowledge and repeatedly take action it has already learned. And this is often referred to as exploitation by the agent, exploitation of the knowledge by the agent. Um, on the other hand, if our agent is constantly exploring by taking new action all the time, the agent might never learn or explore, the, explore an optimal policy. Uh, it will just keep updating the values, but it will never actually encounter an optimal policy. This is often referred to as exploration by the agent. Therefore, whether to explore more or to exploit more is a well-known dilemma in reinforcement learning. Um, in general, we want to do both, with, um, but with some balance. A typical approach is to start with um, high exploration and slowly reduce it over time um, with increasing exploitation as the agent gains more information about the environment. You don't want to exploit when you, have, you don't know anything about the environment. Um, any question about this? Awesome. Um, that 
Hence the first part of my presentation. Now I'll quickly move on to the next part because there's a lot of slides I have to cover. Um, but I'll make sure that everything goes smoothly and everyone understands everything. Um, so next up is the methods of solving RL problem. The first category is uh, tabular methods and the second one is approximate uh, solution-based methods. Um, now, the tabular method methods are basically um, used when your state action space is not too large, it's finite. Um, and, and when it is not finite and it is extremely large or continuous, uh, we sought to approximate solution-based methods. Now let's go to the next slide and start with our first tabular-based method. The very first classical approach uh, uh, to solve an RL problem and obtain optimal policies is using dynamic programming. Dynamic programming um, is a model-based approach and therefore we assume that the model of the environment is known and is finite, right? Um, there are, um, so there are two main algorithms in dynamic programming, policy iteration and value iteration. Um, um, so policy iteration in itself consists of two steps, evaluation and improvement. So we first do a policy evaluation, given a particular policy, we first evaluate it. I'll explain in the next slide what it means to evaluate. And then we improve that policy and then we have a new policy and then we evaluate it again and, and so on. The policy evaluation step is often referred to as prediction. Uh, and the, on the other hand, the policy improvement step is often referred to as control and enforcement learning. So um, as mentioned, the policy iteration method for solving a finite RL problem has two steps, policy evaluation and policy improvement. The first start, um, we first start with the policy pi zero, right? Evaluate the value function corresponding to this policy and then perform a policy improvement step. And with this new policy, we iteratively repeat these two steps and eventually converge to an optimal RL policy and the value function. So the proof of convergence uh, for this is pretty straightforward and can be referred to from the textbook um, by Sutton and Berto. Um, this is one of the most popular textbooks on RL. Um, the policy improvement step is intuitive because you're trying to find um, the best action A in state S here. Yeah, so in this, in this one, you can see you're trying to find the best value. Sorry, you're trying to, for, for, so we are trying to evaluate this policy, right? Um, so for, for, for the, the probability for being in state S can be given by the best Q value across all the action, right? So the, the action corresponding to the best Q value, basically. So if I have like uh, five different actions and I have values corresponding to each of those actions, what is the best Q value? And I select the action corresponding to that best Q value. That will basically be my selected action for being in state S. Um, that's, the, that's how we improve the policy. Once, so, but there is a tricky part. How do you know this Q function to, in the first place to try to maximize over all the actions? So that comes from the policy evaluation step. So you have to start with some random policy basically, um, and then evaluate the value function. And then given that value function, you can also basically evaluate because they are very similar in, in their expressions. Um, you can evaluate the Q value function and then do an improvement step, which is basically saying in this, in this case, the algorithm says you basically do an arg max. So take an action corresponding to the maximum Q value in S and A. And you get a new policy with this and then you do it again and again. And as I said, convergence is guaranteed. Um, all good so far, but what does, how does the policy evaluation step works? Um, given a policy pi, how do we find true values corresponding to that particular policy? Let's understand that in the next slide. Now, the first step um, of policy iteration is to evaluate any given policy, right? This basically means the agent knows the map and is trying to figure out the goodness or badness of each state. 
in this MDP. Now, I said the agent knows the map, but I'm not saying whether this map is optimal or not. It could be a random map, right? But for any given random map, we can evaluate the values for each state. Um, recollect the value function expectation equation. Assume, assuming that we are following a policy pi and the environment model is known, we can iteratively apply the Bellman expectation equations for the value function and converge towards the true value under current policy pi um, using the expression here. So this is the expression for value function. And as we saw, this ex expectation can be replaced with these summations over the, uh, the action distribution and the straight transition matrix, uh, straight transition distribution. And we already know the policy. We already know the model because I assume that I have a model. I can evaluate uh, basically this policy iteratively using dynamic programming uh, like we do in any path planning approach. In this equation, as k tends to infinity, the value function approaches um, the true value v pi for that particular policy. Again, I'm not saying when I'm considering this policy pi, random policy pi, the v pi that we get is for this random policy, it might not be an optimal value function or it may not be this, this policy in the first place may not be an optimal, an optimal policy. Um, uh, now let's try to understand uh, this through the maze example. Uh, here we start with some random policy, right? Um, basically um, random action in each state and with zero values for each state. So I have zero values across all the 16 states. Um, in each iteration k, we see that the value function is updated, right? We update iteratively the value function. And for instance, if I'm considering this random policy, I can get the value corresponding to that. And then I do a policy improvement step, which is basically, for instance, in this case, for k equal to one, if I do a policy improvement step, I basically ask myself, how, um, what is the, for instance, if I'm in this state, what is the best action I should be taking? For instance, here it's equally distributed because this is a start state, I think. Uh, let's consider this one, actually. So in this, in this state, if I do the arg max uh, for policy improvement step, I basically know that among all the three action that I can take, these two are minus one, right? So this is the probably the best action I should be taking. That's why you, you get an arrow on the, on the left side and not on the, any other direction. Similarly, in this case, no matter which action you take, you will an, end up with minus one reward. So the probability is still not, the policy is still distributed equally um, and so on. So if, so in this, in this example, as you can see after K equal to three iteration, I have in my optimal policy here. I do not have to, go more, but if you do that, you can basically have other policies. So the optimal policy remains the same. However, the value function may be different. Note that, yes. Any questions about this? Remember that uh, for policy iteration method for of dynamic programming that I'm discussing right now, you have two steps. Um, that you have to do iteratively policy evaluation, which is basically given a policy pi, you want to find all the values for your states. And then you do a policy improvement, which is basically updating your previous random policy to a more logical policy. And it might also be obvious from the way it is um, that this will converge to an optimal policy because it's nothing but similar to planning algorithm. Now, this policy iteration method of dynamic programming can be generalized to any algorithm for evaluation and improvement, as long as um, the improvement step guarantees the convergence, basically saying that the new policy that you get is always better, at least better or equal to the policy that you had earlier. If that is guaranteed, uh, you can basically use any evaluation and improvement algorithm uh, for policy iteration. So this is a nice graph of, this is basically for the, the policy iteration that we just saw. It's not generalized because you're still using greedy 
method for selecting your new policy, right? Given the value function, you update your policy using this greedy method. So basically the argmax method is called greedy method uh, uh, for improvement. Uh, any questions? Okay, so for the next method of dynamic programming, which is called value iteration, don't confuse the name uh, with value evaluation, which is a sub step for policy iteration. Um, the value iteration in itself is a, a way to solve RL problem um, like policy iteration. And this is because the policy iteration may be inefficient um, because we have to do the evaluation for our current policy all the way and then do the improvement. So we have to wait until our policy, uh, our value function is evaluated and then only we can update our policy. On the other hand here, um, as you can see, there's a max over all the action. So as you are updating your value function, you're always considering the max over um, the maximum value over all the actions. Unlike in the previous one, let me go to the policy evaluation step. Here you are basically acting based on your given policy. You're not optimizing your value function. You're just basically finding the true value for that given policy. Um, as compared to that here, we are at each step improving our policy. Does that make sense? Uh, because the value function it is in itself is having a max over all the action at each step. So if I go from k equal to zero, the value function first iteration will be the, the best possible values in the next states that we started from. And then for the next step, we'll basically keep on improving it. So this is basically not following any particular policy. That's why it's called an off policy algorithm. And the policy iteration method, it's uh, referred to as on policy because we are always evaluating our current policy and then moving on to the new policy. On the other hand, for value iteration, we are constantly at each step updating our policy in a way. Questions? So those were two dynamic programming approaches. Uh, there are more, but I won't be dis discussing them in this, in this presentation. Um, with that, now let's try to understand Monte Carlo-based approach. Now the Monte Carlo methods um, use a simple idea. It learns from episodes of raw experience without modeling the environment dynamics and computes um, the observed mean as the approximation of the expected return. Um, that's a lot of information, but um, remember that the Monte Carlo methods, they learn from the entire sequence of the of any particular episode. So you start from some action and you collect all the state action reward pairs or tuples till the end of the episode. You do not stop and do not learn in anything in between. After you have collected all this um, experience for this episode, what you basically do is uh, you try to um, model your reward. You basically try to um, move your reward to the expected return, trying to approximate. So if my true return for this iteration, for this episode is GT, I might be doing this iteratively, right? And I have for, so these expression are basically representing mean over all the episodes that we are taking. So if I am visiting state S in one particular episode, I might visit that state again in this particular episode. So I have to take mean of this, of this return that I'm considering. Does that make sense? Because the reward is the reward function, we are not given any model. This, this method, Monte Carlo method is a model free approach and we are not given any model. So we do not know the reward function and we do not know the transition probability. So we basically have to empirically approximate our returns towards the expected return that was formulated earlier. And this method is only applied to episodic tasks. And there are two variants um, of, of doing this um, averaging uh, of the rewards. You can basically do it based on every visit 
which is basically saying in a particular episode, every time you visit your state S, um, you, you consider that in your average uh, uh, formulation. On the other hand, the first visit Monte Carlo approach is only that only considers the first visit uh, in a particular episode. So, um, and then this um, this this expression for value and Q value are just to evaluate a particular policy, right? Uh, there is there has to be a following policy improvement um, step also, which I'm not showing here, but it could be greedy or anything else. Um, questions. So just remember the Monte Carlo methods consider the entire entire sequence of episode. So um, now let's go to the next slide, which is uh, a very important algorithm. Um, so finally, we are ready for one of the most important and central idea of reinforcement learning known as temporal difference learning or TD. Now TD learning methods update targets with regard to existing estimates rather than exclusively relying on actual rewards or complete returns as in MC methods, as in Monte Carlo methods. Um, this approach is also known as, known as bootstrapping, right? So what basically I'm trying to say here is um, you basically estimate a TD target, which is local. You don't have to complete your entire episode, right? Notice this, this TD target consists of only your reward, uh, immediate reward, RT plus one, right? And then a discounted value of next state, that's all. So you consider that you have some value function existing, that's why we call it bootstrapping. We assume that, and we are locally trying to estimate, using another estimate, we are trying to find a, a new target. Now note that this reward is coming from environment. That's why this makes sense. So the, the update equation for value for any state S, uh, for any state ST here, um, the update equation looks like this. And if you, if you notice this very analogous to um, uh, weight update equation in, in neural networks. So where alpha can be representing a learning rate. So this GT, now is not the return from my entire episode sequence, which was the case in Monte Carlo, right? In Monte Carlo, this GT represented the entire return from starting from state ST till the terminal state ST, uh, S capital T basically. So that was the case in Monte Carlo, but here it's just the immediate reward and the value of next state, discounted value of next state. And this might, this value of next state in itself might be an estimate, uh, might not be a true value or an optimal value. So with that, um, I replace this GT with a TD target. This is known as TD target. So we are trying to move our value functions, value function towards this value. Whether it's positive or negative, this will take care of it. This expression will take care of it. If, it's, if this uh, target is negative, we are basically penalizing our value function and we are moving it towards a lower value. Similarly, if this, uh, this is a good target for our current value estimate, we basically improve our values. And similarly, the Q value estimates can be represented. Update rule can be represented here, similar way. So just replace all the VST with QST80. Any questions? This is again, Monte, uh, the temporal difference learning is again a model free approach. Um, so no need to know the dynamics of the environment and bootstrapping here basically means that you are not starting scratch or you're not considering the entire episode. You're starting in between with some pre-assumptions that you have some estimate of your values. And it could be that you are starting with a random value, but eventually this has a convergence property. Um, and this method has a convergence proof. So um, let's move on to the first uh, TD based approach. Do I have a question in chat? Okay. So 
Um, moving on to the first uh, variant of TD method, right? It's known as SARSA. SARSA basically refers to the procedure of updating Q value by following a sequence ST, AT, RT plus one, ST plus one, and AT plus one. So I'm all. So this is the only sequence that I'll I'll be considering in each iteration. So I'm in state ST. I take an action AT. I get a reward RT plus one, and I land up in state ST plus one where I have an action AD plus one. So this name SARSA basically comes from this S-A-R-S-A -S -A, um, because that's the only, um, in each iteration, that's the only thing we consider, right? So um, looking at the algorithm at each step, we pick an action from our current policy or the Q values here. So take an action, observe the reward in the next state, right? And we update the state action value based on the current estimate. So remember, this is basically the T TD target again. So in state S, right, in state S, I take an action A and I observe a, re observe a reward R and A next state as land up in state, next state S dash. So now this becomes my TD target, um, R plus, which is my immediate reward plus gamma Q of S dash A dash. And this is my existing Q value. And I basically try to move towards whether this is bad or good, I move towards or against it. And then I basically update my states and actions, right? So this action is basically coming from some greedy policy. So, um, given a Q value, I can basically max over all the, all the Q values that I have and find the best value and find an action corresponding to that best value. So that's, that's how this A dash comes from. Um, now this is very similar to value iteration, except for here we are learning from estimates instead of a known model, right? Um, uh, please note that here, at each step, we are choosing our action from current Q function. Therefore, this method is considered on policy. So whenever we are choosing this action, we are basically choosing it from our current policy and the update rule is as followed. Um, now, uh, a similar, a very, very similar approach to SARSA is Q learning. The only difference is this approach is off policy TD control as compared to the on policy SARSA. Um, in this case, instead of um, optimizing, as in SARSA, we were considering each of these action and we were tr basically trying to evaluate the Q value, expected Q value, right, over all these action. That expression that I just showed you was uh, basically approximating the expectation equation. However, in Q value, what we are trying to do is basically trying to approximate the optimal Q value expression. So. I have a max here, right? What this means is every time I update my, um, so this becomes my target or estimate. Every time I update my Q values, it's based on the maximum possible value of Q over all the action, rather than um, choosing an action from my current Q estimate and then just using that value. I'm just taking, in this case, I'm taking max over all the action. So that's the only difference because now, um, as in, you if you remember, as in value iteration method of dynamic programming, we also did something similar. We did the max uh, and at each step we were learning instead of evaluating a particular policy. So you can basically look at both of these algorithm as this one follows a current policy Q and um, keeps it until, until the end. And in this case, um, we are basically moving our estimates all the time. So, and um, this is a good representation of what both of these algorithms are actually doing. This is expectation, trying to approximate expectation. And this one is trying to approximate the optimal Q value. Questions so far? Okay. Um, now, um, the last part of tabular methods is 
and step bootstrapping, which can be seen as an extension to TD learning. This is a very quick slide um, that I want to cover. So in this one, as we saw earlier in TD learning, we built our estimate based on a single step transition, right? However, we can look even farther uh, than a single step. So if you remember in, in TD that I just explained, the estimate was uh, my immediate reward and a discounted value of the next state, right? And when we do this, that, that TD method is often referred to as TD zero because I'm only considering one step ahead, right? And if I have, I look two step ahead, basically I take my reward, immediate reward, and I am also considering discounted reward for two next steps, right? This is the value function. So I'm looking two steps ahead basically, and this becomes my TD one and so on. And I get my TD n step algorithm like this. So it, 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 this is basically generalizing the temporal difference learning to any number of step um, that one might to um, build their estimates from. And note that this is very interesting. So note that when this n reaches infinity, basically saying that my episode terminates, what I get is nothing but Monte Carlo. Remember Monte Carlo was learning from the entire sequence of episode. So all the, all the rewards that it encounters throughout that episode, it was learning from that. And this is exactly that expression, right? This is expression for GT. So, so uh, this is very generalized, the temporal difference learning based on whatever step you have, um, how much you are bootstrapping, you kind of trade off between TD and MC approach. This is another representation of a, of a similar idea. Questions? Okay. Uh, now that completes our tabular uh, method-based approach. Now we move on to the more general um, uh, method based on approximation. These methods are proven to be successful in many real world application. And they stand at the forefront of modern reinforcement learning. First one uh, we'll cover here is the prediction and control. Um, and the particular algorithm I chose for this, uh, for this uh, explanation is the deep Q learning, um, which I'll explain in a bit. Uh, now, as you can imagine, tabular methods are impractical for large state and action spaces. Um, in such RL task, we will, we will therefore use parameterized approximation methods um, as shown here. The parameterization can therefore be done using machine learning or deep learning approaches. Note that we have added theta to our Q value um, expression here, uh, notation here. Um, now the Q, Q learning algorithm discussed earlier, um, which was the off policy variant of temporal difference learning um, has been proved to be unstable with approximation methods. Right? If we take the Q learning as is and try to um, uh, parameterize it, it it's, it's very unstable. However, in 20, 2015, in the year 2015, Min et al. from DeepMind published a paper in Nature proposing a modification to the existing Q learning approach with approximation. Their approach was uh, evaluated uh, on several Atari games and was considered a turning point in the field of deep reinforcement learning. The two main modification were adding experience replay and periodic uh, target updates. Um, let's try to understand this in the next slide. So this method is popularly called as deep Q learning and it uses two separate parameterized networks. I'll call the first network, which is here, the running network and the sec second network as the target network. Now, D now the DQN maintains a memory called replay buffer that stores a large number of previous experiences as tuples containing state action reward and next state. Um, this is basically coming from the environment. In each iteration of an episode, a batch of experiences is sampled. So for instance, if this is like storing 10,000 values of these tuples, I'll maybe um, sample 128 and randomly sample them. So in, it, in each iteration of an episode, a batch of experiences is sampled from this replay buffer. Um, this batch is, uh, is then used to estimate 
the one step TD target using the target network. So I have a target network, which I keep frozen here, right? I do not update this, this very frequently. Um, so what I do is basically from this replay buffer, the uh, replay memory, the batch that I sample, I calculate for each of those sample, I basically calculate my TD target. Remember the TD target is nothing but reward plus the discounted value of the next state, just one step, okay? Um, this estimate is used to update the parameters of, of the running network using this loss function. So whatever the estimate I get from here, right? I get my Q values from the running network and I basically find the difference between those two values using the um, TD update rule that I discussed earlier. Vs is equal to Vs plus alpha into GT, my, um, GT minus V of S, right? So instead of V of S, we have Q of S A here. So I find the, so uh, if you look here, this theta minus is parameterization for the target network and theta is for the running network. And this now becomes the R plus gamma max over all the next day, next actions. Um, this becomes my TD target. And this comes from my, this is my current Q value, right? So I want to take this estimate into account while I'm updating the parameters of my running network. Any questions about this? Uh, might be a bit confusing, but I'll, I'll try my best to explain. Okay, so based on this loss that we just calculated the, calculated the weights of the uh, target. So, so the weights of the running networks are updated, but the weights of the target networks are kept frozen and are only updated once a while. So that is like a parameter on how frequently you want to update that. Um, now, this avoids the problem of non-stationary estimates. So this estimate is basically coming from a frozen network. And if this network was constantly moving, if I'm assume that this there was no target network, I'm, const I'm also estimating using my running network. Now this running network is always modified. The weights are constantly modified, right? And when I do that, I have a non-stationary problem. My estimates are basically moving all the time. That's why we, um, this paper, they used a, a, a frozen target network, which, we, which they only update um, less frequently. Um, so after the running network is updated, um, using this loss function that is mentioned at the bottom. The agent acts in the environment based on the running network and stores the experience back in the replay buffer. So this replay buffer is constantly updated. Um, the primary advantage of using replay buffer is that it breaks the correlation between corresponding experience samples. So for instance, in a game, yes, I'll, I'll get back to you, solution. So for instance, in a game, um, um, the corresponding frames may be very highly correlated. For instance, if you're playing Pong, corresponding sequence of like five states, um, five next states may be looking very similar to each other. So when we are randomly sampling from this replay buffer, we are breaking that correlation between, between corresponding states. Yes. Uh, Henry, sorry, I mean, I think this is too late, but uh, my question is just that, uh, is there any theory on how often the target can be changed? Like the how, night issue. How often the target can be changed? The target network can be changed. Uh, like, is there any theory on that? I'm not particularly aware of um, this part of theory, but I mean, uh, to what I have experienced, it's still a parameter that you have to evaluate based on how stable your learning is. So if your learning is diverging very quickly, you may want to keep the target frozen for a longer time because your network is basically not stable. So um, does, that, does that answer your question? I mean, I don't, I don't know any particular research research based um, on 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 this thing, like how frequently you should okay. get the target. But it's the target. The main um, the main purpose of adding a target network is to stabilize the learning. So I would I would assume that it's the parameter that you need to evaluate by your experiment model. Sure. So I mean, it's a way to estimate it, approximate it. Exactly. 
So another set of yeah, another set of based on uh, what relation can you mute yourself with a lot of wind noise? I am muted. Uh, okay, maybe there's someone else. Anyway, so another set of uh, I think I should um, hurry up because we are we are well about time. Uh, I think this is my le next, uh, last slide. Another set of uh, approximation based method alg um, based algorithms are policy gradient based methods. Uh, now in policy gradient based methods, um, we directly try to learn the policy with parameterization. So I'm not going to cover this topic in depth here because we don't have time, first of all. Um, um, and it will in itself require um, its own set of lectures. Um, however, here is a peek at the gradient function um, used in policy gradient methods. So the first expression shows the gradient update um, uh, rule. And um, the second expression here, um, so for the first expression, the derivation can be found in the textbook I mentioned earlier. Um, in addition, the weight update uh, follows a gradient ascent rule based on the above gradient expression. So you are notice that unlike other deep learning algorithm, we are having a plus sign in between because we are trying to do gradient ascent instead of gradient descent here because we want to, we are dealing with rewards basically. Um, there are several different policy um, gradient based methods such as reinforce, actor critic, A3C, and so on. The actor critic based methods also involve learning additional parameterized value functions in addition to the policy function. Um, so with that, um, I would like to conclude this presentation. Thank you so much and sorry about the, about the time. I did not est estimate that. And uh, next thing would be you can um, if you have any ideas about, about reinforcement learning uh, or any doubts, you can ask me or refer to these resources that I have on the, on the screen. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nitish. This ends the session for today.